All right. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. We are going to transition to the next talk. Um, right. Next up, we have Graham Reed and uh, a second presenter for this talk as well, Swetha Umpabathina from University of California, Los Angeles. All right. Thank you very much. Um, as he said, I'm Graham Reed. I'm a PhD candidate at UCLA. And presenting with me is Swetha, a uh, undergrad researcher who's now a uh, postdoc in Jeremy Sue's group at Chapman. Um, and we're going to be talking about our work on using a TA training class to um, sort of investigate how absence policies get designed and interpreted by graduate teaching assistants in the life sciences. So when I say unexpected absences, I mean instances where a student doesn't come to class and the mechanisms that govern that that aren't already covered by some broader institutional policy. So things like travel or personal reasons that student might have or their illness, but not those covered by things like a Center for Accessible Education. Um, these sort of absences were particularly interesting to me because I was really interested in how you sort of maintain the learning environment when a student doesn't come to class when you expected them to come to class and designing an optimized policy from both the perspective of the student and the instructor. Um, I did this because I felt like there was a frequency of good students who are missing out on learning because of absences for reasons entirely outside the class um, that really impinged on their learning. And I figured that a evidence-based absence policy could really help maintain learning objectives even when students are absent. Um, so we really thought about things about what exactly should we do when we come to class and what policies either maximize benefit or reduce harm from both the student and the instructor's uh, perspective. When we went into this project, we really expected that a lot of different factors would play into how effective absence policies get designed, including the structure of the course, the reason why the absence popped up in the first place, how long the student is away for, and methods of communication about that absence. So to investigate this, we went through a TA training class for first time teaching assistants in the life sciences. Um, and we iterated this class. Uh, we're presenting data from two iterations, although we've actually repeated this uh, data collection scheme every quarter since we designed this project. So we have a lot of uninterpreted data. Um, but basically, first time TAs were taking this course concomitantly with their first TA ship. And before the class, we'd run them through an attitude survey that both assesses their attitudes about TA ships in general and their attitudes about a bunch of different things regarding absence policies. Halfway through the class, about five weeks in, we put them through an activity where we asked TAs to design um, their ideal absence policies, uh, or we gave them scenarios where we sort of ran them through, a student comes to you saying that they have to miss class because of this, what do you do? And then after the class, we gave them the same attitude survey that they got beforehand so we could compare pre and post class. Um, so to talk about some of that data, I'll hand it over to Swayth really quick. Yeah, so for the attitude surveys conducted in the course, these were some of the reasons that were on the surveys and what the TAs might found was justifiable or not justifiable absence. We essentially asked the TAs to analyze 13 different reasons as to why a student might miss class and tell us if those are good reasons or not to miss class. And as you can tell from this graph, we have we got a fairly wide range of responses from reasons like the death of a family member to a student being sick themselves as something that TAs would find justifiable, whereas other things like uh, work-life balance and course workload were not deemed as, uh, were less likely to be justifiable to TAs. And even as you can tell, like post-course, some of these things that like work-life balance and course workload ended up being more justifiable to um, TAs, which was very interesting. And um, so in this, from our data, we find that TAs who don't think that students should have to provide proof of their need for an accommodation tend to justify more absence reasons. Um, basic, and this made a lot of sense because like if a TA does want, is 
does want proof, they're more likely to be looking for something um, for a good reason. And um, if you look at the graph, the post serve, uh, post course, you'll see that absence reasons, um, ju- the uh, that graph shifted pretty significantly. Um, TAs tended to be more lenient after the course. Um, more TAs didn't think that students should provide need to provide reasons for accommodations. And honestly, this could be due to TAs taking the course, um, or it could be that they're finally like TAing in per- for the first time, and that experience changed their opinion on. Um, uh, absence reasons, but we're not sure what is exactly for that shift. Um, and so we're, we're also interested in really understanding what attitudes about teaching informed how TAs decided their absence policies, like, are there certain beliefs that a TA might have about what makes a good TA or how they view their TA shift as an important part of their professional development? And So on the graphs, we are investigating the question of whether or not teaching is a priority for TAs and the people who disagree or the TAs that do value their TA ship as something important for their professional development. And before the course, we got this really nice, normal looking curve, bell-shaped curve, um, looking at whether or not students should provide reasons for their absences. Um, so before the course, motivation did not really predict whether or not students should justify their absence, uh, absences. However, after the course, we see this rightward, right skewed graph where, um, the students who did disagree, who view TAing as vital to their professional development started to truly believe that students should not need to provide proof of their need for an accommodation. So it does seem like the degree to which a TA sees their TA ship um, as a priority priority to them does inform whether or not the students should have to provide proof of their absence. Um, in these in this data, we were also really curious about the time burden of their TA ship and the amount of uh, basically the amount of burden that they foresee they'd have to spend TAing, and we thought that might inform absence policies because. We imagine TAs might have to expend energy handling absent students and catching up students who missed their class. And they probably angle their absence policies in a way that would make it easier for them to do this. However, for this one, we did not find any significant result. If we ask a TA, if we ask our TAs, like, do you think teaching takes away from your important duties that you might have as a graduate student? We find that people, whether or not they agree or disagree, um, most of the TAs justify absences in the same way. Great. Um, since in those surveys, we also had a lot of qualitative data where we asked people to explain how they handle absent students, we decided that we could do some qualitative coding on that. And before we analyzed any of that survey data, we categorized these five categories that we expected people to give answers about. That being the number of absences a student might take, whether or not they have to provide a reason for that absence, whether or not the instructor has to approve those absence reasons, um, whether the course has some mechanism already built in to handle an absent student, like an alternative assignment, um, and mentioning how they expect the absent student to affect, to have their learning affected by their absence. Um, So we got a couple of those qualitative uh, themes coded. Uh, that was done in triple kit by myself, Swaith, and another undergrad researcher. And uh, we tossed out any codes that didn't agree. And we wound up with a lot of really interesting results like this, where we found a lot of people talking about having some set policy where they allow a certain number of excused absences that might not have explanations needed to them, and then negotiation popping up afterwards, and a lot of talk about alternative assignments. And what we were really interested in as we analyzed these qualitative data was to get some sense on how that instructor's value in the structure of their course impacted how they designed their absence policy. So we were also pretty happy to see that some people explicitly mentioned things like 
what they expected their students' attitudes to be as they negotiate the absence policies themselves. For example, this TA uh, mentioning that they didn't see value in asking students to provide proof because um, students who are motivated enough to lie about that would just do that, and that that might affect the learning process too. Um, so it was really nice that we sort of went in with hypotheses that we would see all these different things about students, uh, about TAs talking about the structure of their course and about different ways that the students might handle or perceive their absence policies. And those really came through in the qualitative coding here. Um, we would love to sort of quantify this coding a little bit better. And uh, I think adding interviews to this would make this a lot more powerful. Um, but it was nice when we asked students to explain their research um, or explain the rationale behind why they designed their absence policies, we got answers that really reflected our initial hypotheses when we designed the study. Um, so to summarize everything that we talked about today, uh, we found it really interesting that highly motivated TAs were less likely to ask students why they were absent from class, and that that didn't seem to be a function of the perceived workload of their TA ships. Um, which is to say that designing an equitable absence policy seems to be motivational before it is workload based. Although plenty of people in our qualitative data talked about things like, I run a lab class, so my students have a harder time missing it. Um, there's a lot of follow up questions that I would love to get out of this sort of field of study that we didn't really have the capacity for in this study, such as what exactly is the utility that students or the TAs get from asking students to justify their absences and views from both sides, both the instructors and the students of the validity or the rigor of learning done by absent students, especially in classes that have makeup assignments already established. Um, we also got a couple people talking about how it was difficult in their field to make accommodations and fleshing out how to make equitable absence policies for those people, given that really motivated TAs seem to want to be permissive um, would be really important for us to describe well. Uh, our big takeaway from this is that it seems like the sort of modal way the absence policy should be designed by motivated students is more that they should start from a perspective of offering as much permissiveness as they can. And then as the structure of their course dictates student learning in certain ways to close off um, you know, you can take absences whenever you want, but for this lesson, it's important that you participate in this way. So please handle your absence like this in this situation. As opposed to an absence policy where you start off by asking students to justify their absences and then opening it up as the course structure permits. Um, I really hope that this sort of starts greater study into evidence-based absence policies, and we can sort of expand this into something that serves as a platform that really maximizes the potential of uh, handling unexpected absences for both instructors and students. And uh, with that, we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to briefly acknowledge uh, the work done both by Kitty Dixie, who is here right now, and the broader CERTL community at UCLA, who offered us a lot of support and guidance as we designed this project. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you both. We do have time for, for questions for Graham or uh, Swetha. So if um, you want to pop those in the chat, I can read them. Or if you just want to unmute yourself and speak up, we can do it that way too. There are a couple coming into the chat. I'll go ahead and read. Um, how uh, how many were first time TAs in your study? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I don't believe the answer is literally all of them. Katie might actually be able to speak to that a little better because she was instructing the class when this was done. Um, but it's my perception that it was almost all of them, if not all of them. Um, so as Swetha mentioned, one of the big confounds in the shift in um, how people acted before and after the course was that this course was designed to be taken concomitantly with their first TA shift. Um, so we can't tell if the movements are because they took the course or because they got experience teaching. Ninety-five percent, says Katie in the chat. Yeah, um, so sorry, I'm reading the chat too. <laughs> um, we uh, The comment in the chat that many TAs don't or can't set course policy um, certainly came up in our qualitative data as well. We had plenty of TAs talk about how they like felt like their ideal absence policy didn't match their real one. 
And uh, I didn't show the data from that sort of activity that we had them do when they designed their ideal absence policies because we had people do that as sort of a group work activity. And my guess is that there was a lot of bias that people wanted to look permissive because when we did that group work activity, everyone came back with like maximally permissive policies, um, both before and after you told them like to design a real and ideal policy. So I didn't collect that data as efficiently as I wanted to. There, there is another question that popped up in the chat. Any ideas about why the pre-post change in permitting absences for workload? I mean, it makes sense, but would love to know your explanation. You mean um, why it seemed like the amount of time people spend on their TA ship didn't predict absence policies? Um, we didn't have people explain that explicitly in the survey results we gave. Uh, it's the kind of thing that I would have loved to get interview answers for. Um, but we found that a lot of the people who talked about like efficient absence policies in their class talked about them as something that was established a priori. Like if you wanted to have your student do a makeup assignment, they talked about like already having that makeup assignment rather than making it when they see the absence. Um, so it could be that they didn't perceive the absence policy as taking extra work because they perceive that work is already done. That is a complete speculation on my part. Another um just jumping in real quick, another possible thought here is that throughout the course, we did emphasize, you know, with them, we had our own absence policy that was pretty permissive, really having them think about, you know, really trying to be flexible, knowing that first time TAs are juggling a lot of things at that time. And so a lot of them cited that they took absences because they had a high workload because we did ask those questions as well. So that might be part of it too, their own personal experience. I don't know, Graham, if you want to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually, um, if we back up a little bit to the justification reasons that Swayza talked about earlier, we can see that course workload and work-life balance were two of the terms we asked about. And in the survey, we also asked people, which are reasons why you took an absence during this course? And we had more people saying that they took absences to promote their work-life balance or to help handle course workload than we had TAs who justified their students taking those types of absences. Um, which we always thought was a little bit funny. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, we will transition.